So welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 52. I'm Doug Barak, joined by our special guest. Our guest was the New York State Senator and the Borough President of Brooklyn. We welcome Marty Markowitz to the pod. Thank you for taking your time to join me. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you very much. Just too humid, too hot, too humid. That's the truth. This is very true, so stay <laughs> hydrated, stay sunscreen, and stay indoors if you can. So let's get it started. And I just want to shout out my co-host, Chris. Uh, unfortunately, he's not able to join us on this episode. He's taking care of some family matters, but I'm, you know, the man for the job. Got that Brooklyn pride, and I'm with the right person to talk to. You've so, got that Barrett tradition, so don't you worry about it. So uh, when did your vision of putting Brooklyn on the map first begin? Well, it probably began when I was a kid. I knew it was a special place, and it is a special place. It's uh, uh, a the diversity of uh, communities and populations uh, from all over the world uh, continue to inspire Brooklynites for greatness. Uh, it's I always say it's a place where uh, legends are made and dreams come true, and that's Brooklyn. Whether it was the Brooklyn I grew up in, uh, certainly in the mid to late 40s and 50s and 60s and so on, or whether it's uh, 2020s, uh, Brooklyn, uh, it's diverse neighborhoods, uh, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's really the, what America represents right here in Brooklyn. If it happens in Brooklyn, it'll happen in America. Uh, and um, uh, I knew that we were in a special place uh, maybe it was the way we spoke, although we thought that our English pronunciation is the proper English. After all, it's the King's English. After all, Brooklyn is also known as King's County. So we speak the King's English. It's the rest of America that sounds funny. But of <laughs> course, today, the accent of Brooklyn is not the accent that I grew up with. It's a whole different mix of folks, by and large, that live in the borough, but continue to add to the culture, to the excitement, to the unique mix, and yet uh, keeping their own identities uh, that make uh, Brooklyn so very, very special to live in. You live in a big city, and it is still the fourth largest city in America, if it was an independent city, as it was prior to the great mistake of 1898 when we became consolidated with, quote, New York City. And yet you're close enough to get to that other big city, AKA Manhattan. Uh, and so uh, Brooklyn continues to be the most inner borough of all the five boroughs because as your dad always heard me say, in order to leave Brooklyn, you have to go through another borough to leave New York City. Whereas all the other boroughs, you can leave directly from the borough out of New York City. Only Brooklyn, you have to go through another borough. So that means that we are the most inner borough of New York City. We're the heart of the, all the boroughs. We are the heart and soul. And the Brooklyn Knights have this kind of pride. And when you said the accent, it's funny. Most people don't even think I have a Brooklyn accent. I probably don't. But I do say, you know, my water, my coffee, and all those other uh, bits and pieces. But jumping into it, what were some of your favorite? We drop the R. We don't say what her. We say what up. And then we say <laughs> our mother, not mother. So yes, we have. But we're pronouncing it the right way. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I won't argue with you there. <laughs> so what were some of your favorite projects to work on as borough president other than Barclay Center, which we'll talk about later? Well, of course, uh, coming into the borough presidency, I already had uh, years of experience uh, as a state senator. Uh, but uh, a, a significant amount of my time was spent on how could I not only serve uh, those that elected me uh, legislatively and uh, helping them with community issues or, or personal issues, but also uh, navigate government, uh, but also to bring joy and, uh, and happiness to them. And uh, uh, I was coming home a, a day in January of 1979, my very first month as state senator. And uh, I was driving to a meeting and I went right past Midwood Field uh, on Avenue K and L and East 16th Street. And so help me, at that very moment, it came to me, why not do some free concerts at this football field? And from that, uh, I think of all the things that I did as state senator and uh, 
perhaps as borough president as well, uh, nothing made me feel better than to see thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people sitting back, forgetting the troubles that their everyday life poses to them, and to sit back and just have pure joy. So the concerts were certainly a big part of my uh, of my uh, of of the love that I had. Uh, for uh, my constituents and for all of New York. But certainly there are other projects, uh, whether it was uh, uh, celebrating uh, marriages that were 50 or more years, uh, whether it was celebrating uh, Chinese New Year's. But the reason why I celebrate it is not only recognizing the large Chinese American population, but also to, to really to celebrate all ethnics in this beautiful space that we call the city of Brooklyn. Uh, and certainly there were other projects that uh, that I was very much involved in, uh, whether it was for the LGBT community, uh, whether it was the celebration of various ethnic groups that continue to make Brooklyn a vital part of their identity uh, and their contributions to making Brooklyn a, the sizzling, exciting place that it is. And I can go on and on with the projects that I that I organized. And I, to me, it was... Uh, it's what made the job of borough president fulfilling. You know, the position of borough president, of any borough, was a modest one these days. There was a time, uh, and uh, your dad worked for one, my predecessor, who during a period of time, the borough presidents really had significant power uh, within the city government and budget. Uh, but that changed uh, over the years, certainly after charter revision. So what I try to do is to make the job of borough president relevant in the lives of just about every Brooklyn. And I think, by and large, I think that happened. And I hope it will continue to happen under whoever becomes the new borough president as we move forward. Yeah, we'll learn relatively soon. Yes. And you have quite a list of achievements. King's Theater, Seaside Amphitheater, Lighting Up those the Parachute. Are projects, right, those yeah. are different projects. Now, now if we want to get to projects... Uh, you know, certainly the parachute jump. I must tell you, as a boy, um, I never went on the ride because I I can't fathom. <laughs> I don't like the heights there, and I don't like the the uh, cyclone, so that's not my thing. But um, um, I did try my first year or so to uh, see whether or not the parachute jump, rather than just sitting there as a relic that was aging and had little meaning except for people my age and older, I wanted to bring it to life back again as a ride. Uh, and we actually brought in a company from West Germany, at that time, West Germany, uh, who specialized in parachute jump renovation, believe it or not. The cost of it would have been enormous. It probably, I'm sure the New York Post and Daily News would have chased me out of Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I had spent taxpayer money, the amount of money that it would require. And then when they did the math, what the cost of the ride would be to, for a family, it would be beyond the reach because of litigation and liability and all the kinds of insurances. The ride would have been $100 a pop. So it's, it's, it became unrealistic. So then I said, why not make it the Eiffel Tower of Brooklyn? Oh, I like has, that. has their empire state building Paris has the real thing. Let's make this our Eiffel Tower. And sure enough, uh, after a number of years, uh, 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 on the second attempt, uh, they got it right. And uh, I think I'm very proud of that. It's really the beacon of hope. It's the, and I think it's the excitement of Brooklyn. It heralds the excitement of Brooklyn. It's stunning. Yeah, uh, it definitely encapsulates that experience when you go to a Cyclones game at night and not just when you get those Friday night fireworks, you see it all lit up and, you know, it brings joy, all that color and, you know, warm hope. And as you said, kind of the heart and spirit. And messages and messages. Uh, happy New Year. Merry whatever. Happy whatever. So it really it's a, it's a real unique structure for all of Brooklyn. And then uh, certainly the King's Theater. Um, uh, when I was a state senator way back in 1979, 80, 80 I had pledged to uh, the folks of Flatbush that um, that if I was elected state senator, I would work on the King's Theater, Lowe's King, Lowe's Kings. Though we said Lowe's, but it's Lowe's, uh, but Lowe's Kings uh, that I knew 
the theater all my life, of course. And I'm young enough to remember before we had air conditioning in our homes or apartments, uh, we used to run to the theater uh, for air cooled during the summer or stand by the door so we can feel it. Um, um, those days, by the way, Doug, they used to give glassware and silverware and dinnerware when you bought a ticket. You got a piece of dinnerware or a glass. Were you able to bring it home? Believe it right, of course, to bring it home. I know, well, we're going back a few years now. I I had uh, some relatives who got from the the bank free chairs and stuff. I get it. (laughs) But but we had promised, and and unfortunately, uh, whether it was through a succession of mayors, uh, we just were not able to get it done. Um, The building was almost condemned. Giuliani, in fact, wanted to... Uh, have the building demolished and to uh, put a mall uh, in its place over there uh, f- for the vitality of Flappish Avenue corridor shopping area. But luckily, we were able to defer that. And finally, uh, because as a senator, Doug, I was a Democrat and I'm proud of it, but the Republicans always ran the Senate, always until just relatively a few years ago. Um, um, and in those days, uh, as a minority senator, you couldn't get a penny. All the money went to the Republican majority or the Democratic majority in the assembly. Uh, and so uh, when I became borough president, I finally had capital funds that I could then allocate. And that's when the process began to restore the Lowe's Kings, the Lowe's Kings, into the King's Theater. And today, there's no question that as we move ahead, I know that the theater will continue um, to be a vital uh, entertainment venue for all of New York. It's already part there, but I really do think it will be uh, even stronger in the years ahead. No, and, then of course, and then, of course, uh, there, were, uh, there were other projects, the Ford Amphitheater. Now, that was... Uh, that was uh, the wrap-up project, uh, and uh, your dad can tell you the troubles and challenges we went through uh, because I had hoped that it would be at Asalevi Seaside Park, which was where I did uh, the free concerts in Coney Island from 1991 on. Uh, and um, Unfortunately, the uh, a significant portion of the community felt that it would be the end of the world if we renovated the park there and, uh, and provided an entertainment venue, uh, which would be open just during the summer season. It wasn't a year-round thing. It was just for the summer season. But now if you go to that Asalevi Seaside Park, it just stands there with no use, decrepit, dilapidated. It, it's a shame that a resource like that is, but whatever, uh, we were we were almost kaput. There was no place to go. We had the resources, but we had no place to go to place. And then, uh, luckily, uh, uh, um, uh, Martin Cottingham and others, uh, especially Marty Cottingham, came to me and had an idea about a, a property. Uh, uh, and uh, the developer or whatever, it, it just, it, fo- it fell in. And uh, of course, the amphitheater is still a work in project pro- process. It is uh, not open this year. There's many venues are still not able to open uh, for this season. But I'm confident that in the seasons to come, of uh, the best days of the uh, Ford, Am- of the amphitheater, Coney Island amphitheater will be realized. Uh, when they find that right balance of entertainment and the mix that appeals to uh, Brooklynites and way beyond. So I, I'm, I know we're going to get that right because it's a great resource and a, in, in, in a vital part of America, uh, both yesterday and today and tomorrow, and that's Coney Island. So those are just a few of the projects that I'm doing. Yeah. And one that I really wanted to bring up are the Brooklyn signs. Pride, come on, To me, one of the pride and joys of the borough. It's so simple, but it has so many powerful meanings behind it. So what would, just to quickly ask, what would you say is your most favorite of the signs, if you can pick one? Well, I, I guess uh, I guess it would be um, probably uh, leaving Brooklyn, forget about it. Uh, that, in other words, originally, uh, the signs were just welcome to Brooklyn. 
Uh, and then I said, hmm, I want to say something about leaving Brooklyn. And of course, the honeymooners um, um, uh, was really all about Brooklyn to a degree and Brooklyn characters in its time. And uh, uh, Jackie Gleason would always use the term, forget about it. And it became part of the language of Brooklyn in those days. And so uh, uh, that was the sign that was stolen a number of times. Uh, even though they were highway signs to uh, help me, they were stolen. <laughs> People would cut the sign down. I don't know what uh, uh, gar um, garages or basements they're in, but uh, it happened a couple times, I believe. But uh, um, actually, one of my favorite signs um, was after I put up the forget about it sign, uh, I got a phone call from an irate man. I think I read about this in uh, new, uh, some article. Yes, an Italian-American, so help me, got very mad and said, how dare you, Mr. Markowitz, how can you do this? This is anti-Italian, this, forget about it. It's despicable, it's disgusting. It puts out people, I said, I don't know what he was talking about, because on the honeymooners, there were no Italians depicted. It were that they were Irish or German, but they weren't Italian. It had nothing to do with Italian. It was a, a, an expression of Brooklynese, uh, uh, forget about it. So I said to him, and I explained it as I explained to you, the honeymooners, whatever. And then he said to me, Mr. Markowitz, you're a Jew, aren't you? I said, that's a good guess for sure. Um, he said, how would you like it if you had a side Levy, Brooklyn, oi vey? I, I was on the phone, Doug, so help me. I looked at that phone. I said, wow, why didn't I think of that? That's how that's it happened. Sign. I, I said, thank bad. you very much. And I put the phone down and... Within a month or two, that sign was up on the Williamsburg. And I must tell you, probably the forget about it and the oy vey are probably the two um, um, most uh, 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 most uh, popular signs. And uh, Eric Adams, uh, my successor, continued to keep those signs uh, on the highways. And I'm very appreciative that he did that. Yeah, no, I think I think Oive is perfect. I mean, that's how I feel when I'm leaving my home. You know, this is <laughs> as as some of the other signs say, the heart of America. Believe the hype, not just that's the Berwyn experience. Guys, how sweet it is might be one of my favorites as or, well. Oh, that's another one. Oh, I forgot about how sweet it is. Of course, that's again uh, honeymooners, and then of course um, uh, Brooklyn in the house. Welcome, <laughs> Brooklyn's in the house, and that's uh, that's another sign on the Interboro. So I had a lot of fun. Uh, trying to figure out the signs and the, um, as the, I, my term, third term wound down, I was trying to think of something that we can do for the Latino population. I, this, I couldn't come up with the right, you know, word or several words that would, but I'll leave that to future borough presidents if they're interested. No, <laughs> you know what I... it's all about, Doug? It's about branding Brooklyn. I mean, that's why I did it. A, to put a smile on your face. And the other part was that when you came into Brooklyn, you saw a sign. It didn't just say, welcome to Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, I wanted it. Uh, my predecessor, Howard Golden, had uh, welcome to Brooklyn, the fourth largest city. And I understand that was welcome back, Carter, and I understand that completely. Uh, but I wanted something snappy, and I think we came up with it. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. The inclusion of a lot of people of Brooklyn is kind of like what we're about as a borough. So I think, you know, hopefully we get signs that represent everyone one way or form and some positive and joyous occasion. But speaking of keeping with the joy, so growing up, you lived not too far from Ebbets Field. So how much of the Brooklyn Dodgers legacy inspired you to bring a major league team like the New Jersey Nets to the borough? Well, it's uh it totally inspired me. There's no question. First off, I, on a personal level, Doug, I'm not a, into sports at all, just about. Uh, I was into baseball tremendously. And when the Brooklyn Dodgers broke our heart and relocated uh, to uh, La La Land, when they did that, that really wrapped up my interest in Major League Baseball. Sure, uh, the Mets became the team that I would root for. Anyone other than the Yankees. And I still feel that same way, even though the Yankees are different than they were back in the day. But uh, the only reason I support the Yankees is that we need the tax revenues. And if the Yankees were in competition for the World Series against any team other than the Mets, 
then I would support the Yankees because it's good for New York City. But beyond that, there's no passion in me for them at all. At, at least I'm, I'm talking from an older head now. Yeah, uh, yeah not at all. But, uh, but I wasn't, so the sports is not the thing. What I do know is that religion and family, sports, uh, these are some of the things uh, uh, that bring us together as, as New Yorkers, as Americans, and as Brooklynites. And we were lacking in Brooklyn, having, even though we had the Cyclones, which we still have, they're a fantastic mind league team, but it's not Major League. And I wanted to see Brooklyn across America. So I must tell you, one of the first things I did was call Mr. O'Malley, who was the son of the Walter O'Malley, who moved the Dodgers from Brooklyn to La La Land. And I called him because I still had dreams Believe it or not, even in uh, 2002, I still had dreams my first year as borough president that maybe, maybe the Dodgers were unhappy in L.A. There had been some ownership challenges out there, if you remember. And I said, this is an opportunity, maybe. So I actually called Mr. O'Malley in a very brief conversation. Uh, I can almost remember, almost like yesterday. And I got through to him, actually, in the borough president, new borough president, blah, 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 blah. And then I said, listen, there's an opportunity. I've been reading in the paper. Is there any chance that maybe to redeem the O'Malley name <laughs> that you would help in possibly relocating the team back to Brooklyn? Well, anyway, uh, as, as fast as you just winked at me, that's how quick the conversation <laughs> ended. <laughs> but I also had to get it out of my system. The truth of the matter is, and I think your dad would be, we don't have room uh, in Brooklyn for a 75,000 seat stadium and the parking that would be oh, necessary. Yeah. We just don't. That, that's not happening. And also, I don't really think New York City would be able to support three major league baseball teams. And the reason why I say that is that there are so many other sports we that, are that are tra- it, just, it just wouldn't work in Brooklyn of 2000 and two and three and four and going today. So uh, I knew that basketball is the sport of Brooklyn in many ways, cutting across all the ethnic groups. There's no question that the basketball, and it requires a smaller space as compared to a stadium. So now the next question is where, where, who? And it obviously, it became very obvious quickly that the New Jersey Nets were struggling uh, in New Jersey. They weren't filling their uh, arena. They were having uh, ownership issues, uh, challenges. And so that is where I focused um, uh, my efforts. And the rest, of course, is history. Let me tell you, it was a very difficult, contentious struggle, uh, as you probably know. Um, It almost didn't happen many, many times. And we're very fortunate that uh, Bruce Ratner, uh, uh, a man from Cleveland that relocated his business and started his business in Brooklyn, who lived in Manhattan uh, and who was not really into sports at all, took an interest after being badgered and threatened and challenged, went through a financial downturn in this country in 2008, 9, whatever, 10 that through it all, he was resilient enough, brilliant enough to be able to make this happen for Brooklyn. And that uh, folks like uh, um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, and uh, certainly the governor were able to uh, uh, be supportive to help make this dream a reality. And by the way, it's not just uh, the Nets, which is a big thing in itself, having a national team in Brooklyn. And uh, but it's also a entertainment venue, uh, employment opportunities, uh, uh, the vitality that what occurred. And we can see what happened there. It's vital revitalization that happened. And eventually the promise of the housing, which has been delayed, you know, very often economics, management, ownership changes. But we'll get there uh, and it'll be. And it already is. You can see during the Black Lives Matter uh, protests that 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 Barclays uh, and the Plaza, truly the heart of the city, 
really became a city center. Um, and, uh, and I think it will continue to be, and that's a good thing for Brooklyn and all of New York City. So I'm very excited. That project that I think is just a, um, a real a dramatic, positive impact. Yeah, um, no, definitely. For Brooklyn and all of New York. Mm -hmm. Oops, entertainment advocacy. It is truly the heart of Brooklyn and it's amazing. And you know, that's definitely a legacy project for sure. So how did you celebrate once uh, Cousin Brucey, as I've heard you call him, you know, got it to, you know, confirm the move? Well, I was at a restaurant on Fifth Avenue. I don't think they're open anymore. Fifth and second, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I was waiting for the call. In fact, uh, uh, um, uh, the first call, I think, came from uh, Bloomberg, actually. And the second call came from Bruce, or could have been the other way. But of course, I went, you know, I think I had, I, I you know, certainly had, I am sure, a bottle of wine. Um, but I must tell you that it was difficult days that people, residents that I wanted to make happy, uh, some I made hostile. Oh, that's the best way to put it. So there were places uh, that I went to that applauded me. And there were other places that would curse the hell out of me, threaten me, actually. So it was a mixed bag um, of, of feelings in and around the area of Barclays, Park Slope. And, uh, but as you got out of the immediate area, the support for uh, the project in was in immense. And uh, it, it shows you, number one, that New York City's got to be capable of doing big things in the future. We can't stagnate. We have to do big things. Uh, we have to be respectful, of course, of uh, people's property and traffic and all sorts of things we have to obviously be concerned with. Uh, but at the same time, we have to balance that out with an ever-changing city and, and trying to make things better and to provide more opportunities for people to have a, have a livelihood uh, and to bring enjoyment uh, to folks. And I think that's all part of the experience of the big city. No, I completely agree. You know, some of my biggest uh, pinpoints for the city is transportation, affordable housing are kind of like some of the big factors for me. And it's extremely expensive, you know, neighborhoods like Red Hook and you know, over by uh, Kings Plaza Mall. Like it's hard. The train doesn't go there. And sometimes the bus, you know, not always reliable. But anyways, I would argue, Doug, that a lot of people in those neighborhoods don't want the public transportation coming there either. So whatever the whatever the issues are, uh, that, that gives you a little suburban feeling. Uh, so these neighborhoods uh, near Kings Plaza or Mill Basin or Bergen Beach, uh, these are neighborhoods that are still vital and part of Brooklyn, our city life. And yet they have a little a little um, a slower lifestyle in terms of a little more suburban style, Brooklyn style suburban. And so there's got to be room for, you know, people to have homes on their waterfronts right here in Brooklyn. I mean, people, all they think about is that we're concrete, but actually the architectural diversity of this borough is truly unbelievable. Whether you go to Greenpoint or all the way to Manhattan. It's Beach, a smorgasbord. It's, 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 so whatever your lifestyle is, and by the way, there are still areas of Brooklyn that are relatively affordable in terms of home ownership. But of course, you have to have that ability. Listen, I didn't become a homeowner until uh, 2010, Two the end of 2009. And I've been a tenant. I was a tenant, public housing and then uh, uh, private, you know, residential apartment building all my life. So um, uh, but there is that that opportunity in Brooklyn and uh and I, I, I'm convinced that although we're going through some challenging times right now, certainly pandemic driven to a large degree, I know that there'll always be folks out there that don't want to live like I, I had a wedding this past weekend in uh, Annapolis, a beautiful little city. And uh, my uh, brother-in-law lives outside of Annapolis. I, you know, you, you could see a few houses here and there. I, I, it's like I'm isolated there. There's no... It, it, for me, it's too quiet. I yeah. need the I need the I need the seeing the people on the street. I need so it, you know we all have our different choices. And of there course, always people that want the excitement of New York always wanted. What they like to do is complain and sell. 
That's it. This is what we are. This is what we don't like. It's too hot now. Then it's too cold. And this is what it is. That's very true. So bringing it back. So we're coming up on the 10th season since the Nets moved to Brooklyn. We talked about it a little bit, but how impressed have you been with the Barclays Center and the Brooklyn Nets? Well, I'm very impressed with Barclays Center. And uh, I've not yet met the new owner. I must tell you, strange thing, Doug, all the people pretty much that were part of the original Barclays, they're all gone. I mean, yeah. when I say gone, they're no longer in the business at all. And this is the third owner, actually, of Barclays now. Yeah. And the third owner of the Brooklyn Nets. And I haven't met this gentleman yet. Uh, and I look forward to meeting him. I really do in the near future, I hope. So Barclays is um, certainly everything I had hoped for and more. In terms of the team, um, I, I think we still have work to do. Uh, of course. For instance, when the Islanders played in Brooklyn, uh, they had no interest in Brooklyn whatsoever because they are truly a suburban team. They wanted to go back to Long Island. Their fan base overwhelmingly was Long Island. In New York City and in Brooklyn, let's face it, Brooklyn was Nick fans as much as uh, Manhattan or any other place in New York City. And it, it, it has taken years and it will take a number of years uh, to, and it's it's already happening, growing our own fan base with their, with their Brooklyn Nets fans. And then the, maybe the root for the Knicks, um, uh, the Manhattan Knicks, as I call them. Uh, <laughs> the... the uh, uh, the uh, w w what's missing, I think, um, is a personality with the team. In other words, where I don't know if that still works anymore, but somebody who Brooklynites refer look at and think the Nets and this person who brings about the excitement of going to a Nets game, seeing him or her there or something that, you know, it's got that special Brooklyn attitude that comes in with the Nets and, and, you know, I know that there are corporate owners of the Nets, but you also need a personality or personalities. Um, and I'm hoping in the days ahead that they find those younger people out there, you know, that can rally the borough and get them totally supportive, whether they're at the game or whether or not the Nets are in the hunt for the NBA championship. Because, for instance, with the Brooklyn Dodgers, win or lose, every game was the World Series to us. You know, it's hard for me to explain. If they lost, we were depressed. If they won, we were thrilled. Uh, and remembering that day in 1955, October, when we finally beat the dreaded Yankees, when we finally beat them, after they beat us for years in the pennant, uh, in the World Series, many times, when we finally beat them, everything stopped for two weeks in Brooklyn. I don't know how to des or describe it to you, it was another day, 1955 is a long time ago, but I must tell you the world stopped for two weeks and everyone was hot, kissing and hugging and work stopped, everything stopped. Now, I don't think that would happen today, but that's excitement for 2022, let's hope. Uh, I hope that comes to Brooklyn because yeah. it, it brings us together and we're all uh, we're all rooting together. That's that's what I hope to see in the days ahead. It will. I definitely I definitely think we're getting close because um, uh, one team I should have also included that recently joined Barclays Center and by uh, the size ownership of Joe and Clara Sai, they also brought the New York Liberty and their young team on the hunt. They're growing in the right direction, you know, from like two wins and they're already double the input. So they have Sabrina Nescu. And Benajah Laney as some of their two big stars. So they're trending in the right direction with the Nets. You know, they have Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Harden. Who would have thought? Because, you know, it wasn't too long ago where they mortgaged their future and then decided to uh, cheapen up a little bit. And, you know, we were in some kind of purgatory. Oh, so so the question is, now I, I like I said, I am no specialist in this. Person, but it seems to me uh, that a team can win that don't have those marquee names that it all depends upon the hunger, uh, it also, and skills, of course, but it also depends upon the health. You know that as well as I do. Of course. And so there's so many intangibles in this, but I'm confident uh, that we're gonna have a NBA championship, not one, many, uh, and uh, all good, but uh, uh, to me, all indications are 
that the future of Brooklyn is very, very bright. And, and certainly starting January 1, we'll have a new mayor. And incidentally, if everything goes the way it seems to go, I think, Doug, for the first time in the history of New York City, all three citywide top office holders in New York City will be Brooklynites. Is that amazing? Eric Adams, Brooklyn. Brad Lander, Brooklyn. Jamani Williams, Brooklyn. And if Eric had not made it, let's say uh, um, uh, Catherine Garcia, Brooklyn. Maya Wiley, Brooklyn. So you know what? We're winners. Brooklyn <laughs> wins. And if Brooklyn wins, New York City wins. That's How true. We, we are. It is. Well, we are the heart of the city. And so my last portion, we kind of let mention this before, you know, unfortunately due to injuries, the Nets were unable to crown Kings County with the championship this season, but we fully expect to court the Larry O'Brien trophy next year. So you kind of mentioned it before, but how much would a championship mean to you and where would you anticipate the parade would be? Because mm. theoretically it could even be next year. It could be next year. And by the way, as a young boy, we always said the same thing after the Dodgers either didn't win the pennant or many times won the pennant but lost the World Series, we'd say, wait till next year. And that's what we're saying, wait till next year. Where would the parade be? Could be down Court Street. It would make sense down Court Street. Maybe down Flappish Avenue. I think we have a uh, we have a couple venues. Someone uh, said Grand Army Plaza, back to where it began, outside Borough funny. Hall. Oh, yeah, well, Borough Hall, I mean, Court Street, sure. So, I mean, uh, and that's where in 55... They had a, you know, a tremendous uh, 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 gathering to celebrate the Brooklyn Dodgers winning the World Series. So uh, I'll tell you what, let's get to it first. We got plenty of venues to choose from. We should we should only be I want to be involved in the planning on that. <laughs> oh, the party plan. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. <laughs> that would be an amazing legacy project to add on to. <laughs> Well, one thing I got to say is thank you, one, for joining us. And thank you because it wasn't for you, you know, twisting Uncle Brucey's arm or sorry, Cousin Brucey's arm to get the Nets to Brooklyn. I pro I don't know what fan I would be. If I might have been a Knicks fan. So because prior to that, I didn't really watch sports. My dad has been a fan since the ABA days, but I, I was busy with my video games and cartoons. So, you know, my dad, uh, we're much closer thanks to what you did in Brooklyn. I truly mean that, you know, Nets moved to Brooklyn. I'm a super fan, as people say. Um so hopefully we'll catch you at a game sometime soon. Hopefully you'll get in touch with the size and uh, get to be Thank part you. of their uh, party planning committee. Thank you especially to Bruce Ratner because yeah. he really deserves uh, the kudos. Uh, lots, lots, lots of people. I was a little part. I was the instigator. But lots, <laughs> lots, of, lots of people Being modest. deserve that. Believe me, and I love it. Just love it. Yeah, the best well. is yet to come, as we say. That is true. Well, thank you again, Mr. Brooklyn. I think that is your legacy name, whether you're too humble to admit it or not. Um, just got to nod with it. Yeah. <laughs> He's too thin. <laughs> okay, but, <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So thank you again for putting Brooklyn on the map. Thank you, uh, Richie. <laughs> and Chris and I, although he's not here, really appreciate you taking your day to talk to us, even though he is not here, but he'll obviously catch the episode. So thank you again for joining us. And, Be in good health. You know, Be in good health. Remember, so to our listeners, remember to send out questions, comments, suggestions, or any thoughts to wingspanpodcast, gmail.com. Do not forget to follow us on social media. Make sure to follow us on our podcast or YouTube, listening service, all that. And as for next time, stay classy, take care, and please get vaccinated so we can get back to what's best. Thank you so much.